in the midst of August. Uh, today's webinar from ISBM is Demand Management for B2B Marketers. It is a timely conversation I'm expecting for many of you. So and I'll get back to that level of detail in just a minute as I talk to you a little bit about ISBM while all of you that are getting ready uh, to visit with us can see us. Today, it's Tracy Daly who's going to be joining us. I'll introduce her a little more formally later. Um, but Tracy comes to us via DuPont and now Op Execs, and her life has been uh, trying to do better about demand planning and making teams work better for that, including the soft skills. And so I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to her. And that other picture is one of those nicer ones that I've had from a long time ago. Um, I probably need to update that, Laurie. Anyway, that was one of my better photographs. So we'll just keep that one there. That's me. I'm Lynn Lianjo, and I'm the executive director of ISBM. Uh, you've joined ISBM, so if you aren't a member, uh, we wish you would join us or at least say hi to us and tell us about what you're up to. Um, but we are a global network of academics, member firms, and partner firms. We were founded in 1982 at the Penn State Smeal College of Business, and we were at that time the only entity that was doing research in B2B marketing. We're still the, the biggest and largest um, worldwide, and we operate at a not-for-profit level. So if you're a member company, uh, your funds help support the research that we then share back with you. Um, our community is interactive together. Uh, Rand Mendez and I manage the practitioner side, which is member companies and partner firms. And on the academic side, we have a team um, in, at Penn State that uh, coordinates our research fellows and our academic partners. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go forward. Um, we have a series of distinguished fellows. These are folks that are uh, doing research and work in B2B marketing around the world. You can see there are beautiful names uh, of their colleges from that. And these folks are, are part of our community and support us. Um, and they teach classes for us, they consult with us, and they keep us generally well informed about the state of things that are understood or and things that need to be researched. Our community of companies, this is a smattering of their um, logos, um, allows us to keep track of where we are in what we're trying to do and accomplish in B2B marketing and drives the need for research and feeds that back to our research partners. And then finally, we have partner firms that help us deliver support to organizations and or gather data and, and in support of research. And this is a collection of our team there. And finally, this is ISBM itself. So um, on the left-hand side right there, you'll see um, our team that is our academic support, um, Gary Lillian uh, Emeritus, and then today, Stefan, who's running the things on our end. Uh, on the right side, you'll see my picture and Rand Mendez and Ralph, our immediate past executive for managing the um, practitioner side. And in the middle, strategically, is Lori because she does everything and uh, she coordinates everything. And if there's something that you're missing, you should send her an email and she'll be happy to help you or me. And I'll then ask Lori to do the work and she does that for us. So she's amazing. And the whole reason that we exist is to get that. She, we would not be here, but for her. So thank her generously. Um, I'll just tell you about a couple of new things that have come out as we just make sure that we've got everybody uh, in the loop. And I'm just going to check the chat. Uh, yep, we'll do that. Um, so uh, there's a B2B handbook of business that uh, is an updated second edition. You might have known this from a while back, but we've just done this over the pandemic period. And those books are now been in print. And if you are a member company and would like a copy, feel free to send me a note. You are going to get one anyway. Um, it's always been fascinating now to how to get people physical objects during the pandemic when you're not going to the office, but hopefully you'll update us if there's a place to send it other than your office address. Um, second. Uh, all the information that we generate, our webinars, our presentations, our, um, our meetings, our jam sessions, all of those assets are managed in B2B Pulse. And so if you're a member, you have access to that forever and that's in there. Um, there's also a curated list of um, articles and things. So we have people reading daily what comes out and then putting things in the portal, maybe sometimes with annotation to help you understand it better. Okay, about today, so always a question, can I get the slides? Can I get this presentation? The answer is yes. So at the end of this, if you have registered for this in your own email address, and not use somebody else's email address, that email address will receive a link to the, the presentation as well as the slides. And that'll happen oh, within tw 24 hours or so of the close of the webinar. 
we would love for you to interact during this event. Um, and in fact, the, Tracy specifically is very interested in having interaction to that. She's got some polls and some other conversations that we'd love to have with you. So we'd like you to just share with us. If you have a question at any time, please type it into the chat window. I and Lori will be watching the chat window. Tracy will be talking. And if you uh, ask a question in the chat window, I will toss it up. Uh, verbally so that Tracy gets it while, while we're having the conversation. So she'd like questions during the presentation, feel free to ask them. If not, we'll ask them at the end. Um, and if you have reactions or other things you wanna share, feel free to use those as well, right? You can raise your hand. We're gonna be monitoring all of you. So just however we can, we'll make sure we can interact with you. Uh, thank you. Um, last, last couple of things, I'm going to remind you that our Mastery Track series is, is running currently and the courses that are following that are shown on this list in September and October. So if you're interested in that, it's not too late to join. Um, just reach out to us. We'll be happy to help you. Tracy is going to be offering a course for us for in demand management. So this is a little taste of what she's got, but you might want to look at that after this. Um, three half days in September. Um, hopefully in that same period of time where you're trying to build your demand uh, management for 2023 and you might want to get involved in that beforehand. And then big fanfare, uh, we're going to have our first in-person meeting again since February of 2020. And we're having it uh, in conjunction with our more, uh, Mormon Mormon members at M Hub, there's a lot of M's in there, in Chicago. So we hope you'll physically join us. You can feel free to register online and get a link to that. Um, and if not, we'll hope that you'll, we'll see you virtually um, and we'll have presenters there in person. So I'm pretty excited about being able to see you all again. I hope you can join us in Chicago. And then the last day of that event, October 13th, we'll be having a marketing excellence roundtable, which again, you might all remember, we've been doing those virtually for the last two years. So it'd be great to be back together again. I hope you'll join us for that. And uh, again, I'll remind you that everything that, that you're looking at might be in the library. So let me uh, get ready to turn this over to Tracy and introduce her. I, I need to, uh, for a minute, just get out of this and into this. So um, I got I had the opportunity to meet Tracy because uh, she was a former colleague of Rand Mendez at DuPont and then Camours. Um, and she began like many of us do in marketing in the technology world in manufacturing and R&D before she made it into the customer interface. And, and uh, so in her marketing and product management roles, she led global business teams, establishing strategies, introducing new products, expanding into new markets, what we all do. Um, but as this demand competency expert, she's leading a demand stream of uh, a demand work stream with um, uh, coordination of all of the functionality uh, in end to end supply chain optimization. She, she at Comores developed these learning mod modules that now are being uh, rolled out. And one of those are, are, you can experience in September. Uh, she helps today or organizations focus on strengthening their demand planning competencies. Um, their processes, their data management, um, ideally their teams, right? So one of the features I think that I love about what Tracy does is it's not just about the numbers and putting it in, into a nice functional IT program. It is how do you work with folks to make sure you've got the best um, agreed upon demand plan, right? And so I think you'll, you'll hear pieces of that today and I'm excited to hear more. So uh, let me just check the chat window because I got something else, right? Okay, so the chat window is enabled everyone. Uh, there's a Q&A window that is not enabled. That's good, thank you, Lori. And I am now going to stop sharing and turn it over to Tracy so she can share her slides. Okay, let's give it a shot. If technology is with me. You got it, we see yep. it. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, do you see the whole window like we talked about? Yes. Yep, you see it. Let's see if it, let's see how this goes. Okay, before we um, jump in, I'd like to tell you a little bit about OpExecs. Um, at OpExecs, we work with our clients to design and execute programs that drive operational excellence. And one of my focus areas in my work with OpExecs is helping our clients strengthen demand management, their competency around demand management. And as you've heard from Lynn. I have a commercial background coming from technical into commercial background. So I'm bringing that commercial experience to our clients together with the supply chain competency to drive an end-to-end -end transformation. 
And today, our supply chains need all the transformation they can get because there are challenges out there. So let's talk, um, you know, let's talk first about today's challenges. After we clear that, because that's big and murky, um, we need to talk about what you need in terms of the toolkit to manage those challenges. And it has to be more than just demand planning. You need to manage demand. So what do I mean by demand management? We're going to spend most of our time today talking about that broader definition of demand management. And it's all the, the soft stuff included with the tools and the processes that Lynn was talking about. So specifically, there are four elements. And um, with each element, you're going to have an opportunity to see some mini snapshot of best practices and then kind of test yourself against those best practices. Look at your organization and assess where you think your organization is versus those best practices. So those will be some polls that we'll do. Okay. So we'll start again, like I said, with today's supply chain challenges. So, um, you know, we've got the global bottlenecks that are making it difficult to get raw materials. Put that on top of labor shortages and lack of equipment that make it difficult to keep the factories running. And all of that while we have rising consumer demand. And now I'm not a great big fan of the word unprecedented. I'm a little tired of it, but this is really unprecedented. So what tools do we have? What are we gonna do around managing all of this? Hopefully you can rely on your demand management competency, but this is where it gets a little bit tricky. So SNOP, sales and operational planning has been around since the eighties and it's hopefully been strengthened within industries and within your own organization. But demand management being a part of SNOP hasn't gotten the same attention as the development of SNOP, sort of the supply chain part of that. And I believe that the reason demand management competency is lagging is because it's hard to get a cross-functional team to develop competency altogether. So what I mean by that is demand management hits marketing, sales, finance, and supply. So when you're trying to build demand management competency, you're not doing it within a pipeline of supply, you're doing it across an entire organization. That makes it challenging, but it also makes it really powerful. So right now I have a lot of clients coming to me saying, my demand planning isn't sufficient to get us through today's challenges. So that's where the challenge is for me to help our clients. So we're gonna do a check-in. I want to understand where you are in your journey, either you personally or as an organization. Um, tell me first where you are in, your, um, in the organization, what's your role, and then I'm going to ask you about your um, comfort with demand management. Great. And so Lori has put up the poll, which should have overlaid over your things. And I, the reason I know it's working is because I can see that some of you have jumped right in because we have two years of training in Zoom. So we <laughs> all of you, if we can, uh, to just give us a clue of where you are. And uh, not surprisingly, we think we, we probably have mostly our own team here, although we did suggest you could share this with anyone else. All right. looks like we're not seeing any more changes, Lori. So go ahead and uh, end that poll. We have 80% participation. And um, right now we have 55% of the people on this call are marketing and 18% are sales and 18% are supply chain. And then we have somebody else from somewhere else, but that's okay, right? So um, yep. mostly marketing, sales, and supply chain. Excellent. Thanks for that visibility. So the next question is, um, tell me about your experience with demand management. So the second poll is up and there's four things. You'll probably have to read through them to figure out which ones you are. They start with, I got it and go down to, I don't got it. I, I don't, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna wait for about the same number of respondents since we had you all, all clicking before. We'll just wait a, uh, another second for a couple more. Okay, that looks like how many we had before. So you can end the poll and give us the results, Lori. All right, there we are. 
So we have just one individual who said that uh, they are at that top level I'm familiar with and I follow best practices. And then we have about half of our group that is in the second category and about half of the group that is in the third category. And gratefully, mm -hmm. no one is here trying to figure out why they're here. That's great. So I'm willing to start with the, uh, what is demand management? And the reason that I'm doing this is to establish a lingo, right? So I, I want us to be comfortable with the difference between demand management and demand planning. So let me start at a high level. Demand management as a process is weighing the customer demand and your business's output capabilities and trying to balance the two. So it's really broad. That's a really high level definition. And I promise we're going to get more granular, but I want to use that as a jumping off point to get to even more lingo. And this, the, the stumbling blocks that I see are around some common terms. So let's clear these so that when I use them, you're comfortable with it. We talked about four elements of demand management. Demand planning is one of those elements. So demand planning is about building a frozen demand plan that everybody agrees to, we all trust it, and it gets shared across the cross-functional organization. And that plan is based on a demand forecast. So the demand forecast is just what it sounds like. It's the organization's best guess at future demand. So organizations that are focused on getting that forecast are trying to find the most productive way to get an accurate forecast. They're looking for clues on what their customers wanna buy, but also when that there's gonna be a shift in demand, those big changes, because they tend to throw havoc into the SNOP process. And then those organizations are measuring how accurate the forecast is versus actual orders. So it's all very important work. So demand management, demand planning, demand forecasting. So now we're gonna go back and talk about those four elements of demand management. Okay, we start with influencing demand. And next is the planning step. So we talked about demand planning. It would be useless to build that plan and not communicate it. So we've got to communicate it. And then lastly, we need to manage and prioritize demand. And I've also called that executing demand. So when we get there, um, you'll understand why that is a little bit more murky. So this sounds like a lot of work, right? but it is worth it. Doing demand management right helps your organization reduce that internal churn that happens across the functions. So that's because everybody's singing off of the same sheet of music and you need that kind of foundation to deal with the challenges we have today. So that brings me back to the matter at hand. Um, so I recently heard individuals from uh, large global companies, and one conversation happened right at my mailbox, which was really funny, um, saying things like, why should I bother forecasting when we can't make enough product to meet customer demand? I'll just let my supply chain, my supply organization, tell me what I'm going to sell to whom. So this kind of thinking misses the power of demand management. When you're truly managing demand, you're enabling your cross-functional organization to improve your customer satisfaction. And you're doing this because you're able to set and meet your commitments to your customers. Mm -hmm. You're improving your business strategy because now you're responsive to your changes in demand. You see them coming and you can move when you need to. You're optimizing product planning to get the most profit with the capacity you have and improving inventory management because hopefully you've increased your chances of making what your customers are actually gonna buy. So these benefits are really powerful when supply chains are a mess like they are right now. So this is not the time to stop your demand management. You need to do more of it. So next we're gonna be getting more granular on each of the four elements that I've described. So for each of the four elements, there's going to be three charts. The first one is going to describe the element. It's going to describe what do I mean by influencing demand. And the second one is where you get to see a few of the best practices that I'm pulling into this conversation. It's just a few. 
In general, I've got 100, right? So mm -hmm. I'm only bringing a little slice and they're in the form of statements. So when you see the statement, you're reading the statement, start thinking about whether or not you recognize it. Is that something in your organization that you see your organization doing? Because the next, the third part of this is you're gonna do a check-in. So we'll have a poll so that you can assess where your organization is for that particular element of demand management. Okay, ready? Ready. Let's roll. Okay, so like I said, demand management starts with influencing demand. So, you know, this is a group of B2B marketers in sales and supply, you're used to the B2B world. So you know how businesses are taking actions in the marketplace to shape demand, to influence demand. They're doing this by market strategies, channel strategies, sales policies, account planning, like prioritization of their customers and um, building product strategies, right? All of that really good work. But what does that mean to demand management? It actually means quite a bit. So I'm going to describe that connection through these best practices. So here's a statement, here's a best practice. Demand has access to and understands the market strategy and the quantified addressable market. So your demand planners and managers should have that information so that they can sense check the demand forecast that's coming into them from the sales team and from multiple sources. If imagine for a moment that demand is far over the addressable market, well, you know, then the demand planner can help and say something's definitely up in the marketplace or I have bad data. So it enables them to do a better job for the organization. I'm gonna use a term here, consensus plan. Now consensus plan is the demand plan that everyone agrees to. So the consensus plan is checked against the market strategy to ensure alignment. And this is done during the demand review and it's an outward thing. It's an outward thing where the people in the demand review take a moment and say, okay, we've just agreed to the demand plan. Now, does it meet our market strategy? And it's really powerful if the answer is no. Because that means oh, we've got some work to do and we've got to align the demand plan with the market strategy or we have to understand what's happening in the marketplace that we've gone off strategy. And uh, Tracy, maybe you'll uh, address this in a bit, but we've had a question come in that yeah. was um, in particular, I think, you know, what many of us are kind of feeling some of these days when we're when a company is in a situation where they don't have enough product that they can supply, should demand management shift from meeting the customer demand, since obviously we can't, to maximizing the profitability of the capacity that we have? Uh, or where does that come in? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and it's the crux of the issue. And sometimes the demand organization doesn't get involved in that important work, which is what pains me, right? That is the fourth element that we're gonna talk a lot about in managing and prioritizing demand. And there's a lot of power in enabling the demand organization to do both of those things. One is to prioritize the customers to see who is going to get that little bit of supply that we have. Um, and, and on the other side, limit the, I mean, we have to align the customer demand to the supply and it isn't done willy nilly. You have to look at it from a priority, prioritization perspective that might be profitability, but it might also be I'm in it for the long haul and I have a priority customer that I know is gonna grow so the demand manager is getting both of those signals. What's profitable and what are my priority customers and putting together that prioritization with sales and marketing. That's what they're executing on. We're gonna talk more about that in element four. Okay. Okay. And then um, the last best practice here is that demand needs to have access to and understand the product lifecycle plans. So I put this here because when it's missing, it can wreak havoc. So what I mean by product lifecycle plans is that demand needs the broad picture of what new products are coming in and what is going out of the marketplace because that impacts, of course, 
what the customer demand is going to be. That's up at the high level. But there's also a level of minutia that vexes the life of a demand planner because the demand planners need to understand what codes, what SKUs are changing. Because ultimately, it's the demand planner's role to send that level of detail to the supply team. So if there's the, a code issue, then there's churn that's going to happen. I'm not getting the right detail, right, in the SNOP process. So product planning is important at those two levels. And what surprises me about demand management is demand planners have to be at both levels. It's a unique individual that has the ability to be up at the high level, sense check, low level, I care about that SKU. So again, that's what the soft skills we were talking about. So here's your first opportunity to do a check-in. Um, so I think, Lori, you've got a poll to overlay here. Hey, Lori's got it up. The, which best describes your organization's ability to connect, right? So uh, again, going through a zero kind of one, two, three, four, um, the band planners understand how we shape it uh, all the way to my organization doesn't have anybody that does demand planning or has that title. And, and the goal here is to understand how you're connecting your demand planners to this influencing work. Chances are you're doing the influencing, but are your demand planners connected to that work? Great. Okay, so we're just going to give it another. We know how many of you there are, so I'm going to wait for everybody to give us some answers here. Again, from the perspective that you might be in ops planning. Okay, we've I think we've got everybody now, Lori. That's great. You can end the poll. And so about a quarter of our folks think that the first one, demand planners understand how we shape demand. And about a quarter of us think that demand planners are not connected to the activities. And about half of us don't know if they do, right? And, and the not knowing, I, I'm pretty sure that's indicative of something, right, Tracy? Yeah, that's, and that is very typical. That's what I usually say. <laughs> yeah. And so if you don't know, that probably means there's no process in place that you're part of anyway, because you don't know, right? Yeah. 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 Is this fun? I just love this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So we'll move on. Um, so this is the second element, the planning of demand. And I'm summarizing this into three high level steps. And it's really scary when I do this. When I train, I actually go into a lot more detail, but here we're gonna stay up on this high level of demand planning. Um, so first, the demand management organization, so demand managers, demand planners, I don't care what you call them, assemble multiple views of demand. So what I mean by that is you're getting unconstrained and quantitative signals from your customers via the sales organization. You're getting marketing input. You're getting product management telling you the, the products that are coming in and out. You're getting statistical views of demand and hopefully economic indicators. I call this the multi-view. So this multi-view is now available in front of you. From there, as a demand planner, you're analyzing the multi-view and then proposing an unconstrained forecast upon which your team is gonna drive consensus. You put it in front of the team and hopefully the team sees themselves in the plan because they input it to it, right? And they go, oh, okay, yeah, I see myself there. And now I'm ready to argue over it and get to consensus. Then from doing that, we're starting to build forecast trust because everybody had a piece of it. Can I ask a question, Tracy? Yep. When you say the team, so what kind of folks are on this team? So this is specifically going to happen in the demand review. So in the demand review, you would often have a representative from, um, of course, sales needs to be there. Um, I say, of course, because they are accountable in the really short term for the plan. So they're there. Um, we want someone from marketing in the room, and we want someone from um, product in the room. It is helpful to have someone from supply. Sometimes I say they're not allowed to speak. So <laughs> they, they are there to be informed. And the reason is because the demand review is 
about the unconstrained plan and building that forecast trust and that consensus on the unconstrained. The constraint is going to happen later. Now, sometimes organizations can't help themselves and they're going to talk about the constrained plan. And, you know, I'm not going to die on that sword. You can't stop everybody. But the supply person can't go, yeah, but. So I've, um, I've had to put a little tape across some supply people in my life. Okay, great. Okay, great. And then lastly, um, this is where the constraining happens, right? So now the unconstrained consensus forecast goes forward into the SNOP process and supply comes back and goes, no, 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 I can't make all that. So here are the constraints. Typically the constraints come back at maybe like the product line in the product hierarchy. The demand planners then need to constrain down at the lower level of detail at the customer level. Remember we were talking about balancing that profitability and the prioritization, all of that comes to bear when they're doing the constraining at that lower level of detail. It needs to be done with sales and marketing to ensure the right prioritization. And in a way, not in a way, in a definite connection to influencing and shaping demand because you might be firing a customer if you don't have enough product for your low priority customers. So now you have a constrained demand plan. Okay, let's talk about my favorite best practices that go along in this planning world. So when we're planning, the first one. So you heard me talk about the multi-view. I am passionate about the multi-view. And the reason that I love this is I want the, the demand planners and managers to see these multiple views in the planning tool because we want them to use their judgment, their experience, their mind to get to an unconstrained consensus forecast that they're going to bring from, they're going to go bring to the team to gain consensus and get, build that forecast trust. They need the tool to be able to do that. Then we also have a need for marketing to contribute to the demand forecast in the six to 24 month period. Now I'm not gonna die on that sword. It might be just six to 18 months, but in the longer term and the midterm, we need to hear marketing's voice. Now, sometimes they don't always have their own line in the tool, that's fine. Sometimes demand brings their voice into the tool, but it's critical that marketing's voice is a part of the multi -view. The commercial organization is accountable for the accuracy of the volume-based demand plan. So typically by commercial, in this case, I mean the sales organization, because they're the ones doing the forecasting in the near term, the near to mid, the zero to six month timeframe. And that's when forecast accuracy is being measured. So usually it's the sales team that's accountable for that accuracy. And then the last uh, best practice here is a little harder. You'd be amazed how hard it is to document assumptions. So assumptions are providing a basis for the forecast. They have specific references that can be evaluated without interpretation and it provides insight on what's changed and why. But it's really hard to keep up with the moving demand plan and find a way to keep track of all the changes in a concise way. So in my course, I do offer um, a way to manage assumptions. I have people who are really good at demand management confessing to me that this is one of the areas they fall short in. Okay, so ready to describe your organization's ability to build an unconstrained consensus forecast. And if I remember what you said, unconstrained means I didn't really talk to my, my manufacturing or operations side. I'm building that unconstrained consensus forecast based on what the commercial folks think are, are, are is quite likely to happen, right? You're right. Thanks for the clarification. That's unconstrained. And the fact that it has consensus, it means that everybody has agreed. Hands in the middle of the table. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one, demand planners have access to multiple views of demand so they can build it. Second, they base its forecast on input from sales. We don't really do consensus. 
We don't really know how the forecast happens and we don't have demand planners. So Lori, could you put up that poll and see how that looks for folks? Oops, Lori, there you go. All right, so do what you all do again. And um, which of those four views is really what you think your business is reflecting? And I'll just reflect as when I, when I was in this role, um, part of the biggest piece I wanted, I wanna let Tracy talk about that maybe a little later. It, the biggest piece was um, overly optimistic salespeople. <laughs> but I'll just, I'll throw that out there and we'll plug that in later. That's a fun one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think we have enough people. You could show the results, Lori. Um, about 20% of the folks said we have access to multiple views. That's great. About half of the folks attending say we base the demand fat forecast on the sales team, but we don't really have a consensus process. And then um, about 30% of our folks say, I don't really know how demand planners build the forecast and I'm not sure I, that we even have any. So, um, but I would say about half of us build a demand plan, but we don't really do this consensus function. So you're normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not best, right. but normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now for the third um, element, which is about communicating. Um, so I'm going to describe communicating demand in three different, with three different main principles. So if you say, well, what is communicating? Here's my three. First of all, I wanna make sure everyone is working off of one set of numbers. And that set of numbers is the frozen demand plan. It's frozen every month. And it's communicated by the demand planner that one set of number is used by supply, sales, marketing, and finance. And again, it's the one we've all agreed to. In, and by using one set of numbers, we're reducing the churn that's created by having multiple sets of numbers. And I, I can think back to when I first started in the world of demand, um, we were working off of a live signal and we were changing the demand forecast to match orders and it was just like a free for all. And the demand forecast was coming into the supply systems live all the time. So every day was a different signal. So there was a lot of churn. And by going to a frozen demand plan, we're able to um, reduce the churn. So that's one example. Yep. Yeah. And a question that comes from that is, okay, so that's great. You freeze it and everybody's businesses is different and everybody wants to talk about how different their businesses are. But if you freeze it and you have very, very large customers that drive big swings in demand and they decide to change their order in the next month, don't you want to know that? Why would you freeze it? Absolutely. Just because you have a frozen, thanks for the question. Just because you have a frozen demand plan doesn't mean that you're going to execute to that demand plan. You you need a process on top of that for handling abnormal demand. So right. yeah. you have this huge order that comes in and you don't want to miss it. It's a one-time thing. How are you going to respond? And that gets to that managing and prioritizing of demand because the plan is just a plan. Yes, you've frozen to it and you're and you're running down that um, execution but it's not perfect. So the orders are gonna come in and they're gonna be slightly different. You need that managing and prioritizing element to handle that. Great, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, another way to communicate is about the demand review. The demand review needs to happen monthly and it needs to handle, it needs to follow a standard agenda. So if I am a marketing person and I go across several product lines, I'm going to several demand reviews, I don't know what the organizational structure is, but let's say I go to several demand reviews, I should see the same agenda every time. I'm not thrown off, same standard agenda, several demand reviews, I can, I can hang. Um, and I'm able to see my voice inside the demand review because I inputted to the demand plan. And then the last one here, demand planners represent the demand plan in SNOP and the commercial processes. So there, when there is discussion about the demand plan, people actually go to the demand manager to ask about it, the demand planner to ask about it. They're the ones that built the plan. They're familiar with the puts and takes. They're your experts. This gives the um, 
role of demand planner some additional stature in the organization. And it really helps from a career perspective for the demand org. They can see a growth potential for themselves. So let's talk about best practices in communicating. These first two are just what we just talked about because they happen to fall, the biggest practices fall right into communicating. The first one, we talked about one set of numbers for SNOP and financial targets. The second is that demand review being held monthly and following a standard agenda. Now this third one, this isn't articulated very often, but there has to be forecast trust across the organization. So sometimes I hear um, from upper management, you know, I can, I'm the upper management talking here, I can predict what the demand is going to be better than our demand team can. I hear that. It usually means there's a problem in forecast trust. There's also an oversimplification happening there because what that upper management is probably talking about is this high level, I'm going to hit this number. It's going to be this many units. It's going to be this many dollars. But what about the minutia that's happening down here at the order fulfillment and the, um, the product level plan? Are we making too much inventory? Have we made a mess down here? That's the level that has to be accurate, not just way up here. Okay, and go ahead. So that sometimes all of that speaks, I think, to um, ex maybe who has the louder voice in management, which which function seems to be running the company at that moment. So, you know, some companies are very marketing focused, some companies are very manufacturing focused, some are product development focused, but it always seems like there's it, it, it's never very really even, right? There's somebody that seems to have a stronger voice. And I think recently that last that last conversation was about, you know, I have to make a sales plan. And if my sales plan doesn't match the demand forecast, well, which one's wrong then? Because one of them is, and it can't be my for my sales plan, right? Um, yeah. And it and should be integrated, right? The sales plan should have been part of the demand forecast and vice versa. So that's why it's so hard to do this work because it's across so many functions, right? There's no stovepipes here. Yeah. And, and but yet everybody is own everybody still owns their own individual metric. I've got to make my sales numbers. Exactly. But the sales number should be the demand plan. Yeah. Okay, good. This is good. Yeah. And so um, I, I've seen this work really well and it is a beautiful thing when it works really well. But I, I love Lynn that you're bringing up this idea of one aspect of the organization is usually the, the king of the moment, right? And I've seen it go across from company to company, I see it differ. From time to time, I see it differ. And um, I always find it fascinating. Demand management has got to survive no matter who is king, right? One of the things that I, um, I've heard throughout the last, I want to say, decade or so, that if you think about SNOP, being gears, demand is the biggest gear. Now, of course, I say that because I love demand, but I've heard supply people say that demand is the biggest gear because it is really what should drive your end-to-end um, -end process. Okay, so the last um, best practice here that I wanna talk about is um, another one of my big fav favorites, and it's talking about risk. So for risk, I'm talking about commercial risk that will interrupt the demand plan, not supply risk. I know there's plenty of supply risk and we usually talk about supply risk, but how are we talking about commercial risk? So I wanna use an example. Let's say we're in a demand review and the demand planner is explaining that the sales team recently heard that our largest customer is evaluating another supplier. So that risk, should be documented in the demand review and discussed by the cross-functional team. Because now we've got a demand plan that may be on, you know, not a very firm foundation. So let's document the risk. Let's all see it and make a decision on whether or not we want to change the plan. If we are okay with the risk tolerance level, we're all accepting, hey, we're going to move forward. We're okay. 
we think the risk is low enough, then we build consensus around the current plan. If the risk is too high, we have to decrease the volume plan. And essentially, we're incorporating that risk into the plan to avoid overproducing. I find that when teams are talking about risk and they're documented, that is the most satisfying way to build consensus because everybody put their hands in the middle of the table. Okay, so how did that feel to everybody? What is your, which of these best describes your organization's ability to communicate the demand plan? So Lynn, you are on mute. Much. We have uh, we have reviews. That's the first one, and we uh, get to consensus. So we have one set of numbers. Um, we do some of this, but we really need to improve how we communicate the plan. I don't ever hear anything from our demand planners about the plan, or my organization does not have demand planners. So um, so let's see. Uh, it's very it's very interesting how this is coming through. Let's just get a couple more people to put their last bits of there and see if anybody wants to be on that first line because it doesn't seem like it. Okay, Lori, go ahead and end the poll. So I would say all but a couple of us say, we do some of it, but we really need to improve our communication of the plan. Got it, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm just making notes so that I can keep track. Always mm -hmm. fun to see where people are. Okay, this is the last one and it's probably um, the hardest to talk about. So Lynn, I'm really thankful for the question earlier. We got a sneak peek into managing and prioritizing when we were talking about what's the best way to deal with demand that is higher than our supply capability. Okay, but let's first talk about what do I mean by managing and prioritizing demand. So I've also called this demand execution or forecast realization. So you might hear any of those terms. I've recently called it demand execution and marketers tend to think of demand execution as the entire like 18 month demand plan as being the execution of the strategy. I don't mean that in this case. I'm talking about executing the shorter term demand plan, defining it as what it takes to get the demand to happen in a month. So let's say um, you, know, you, you froze the plan, orders are coming in, you're executing the demand plan. You may have to manage and prioritize demand because you might be over, either under or over. It's that work that I'm talking about here. So it's including tracking orders. Tracking orders is one of the most important parts of um, the communication process in managing and prioritizing demand. So let me tell you why, I'm gonna use an example. Let's say the frozen demand plan was frozen and said, we're gonna sell a hundred units in a given month. And the demand planner is watching the open and closed orders to ensure that those hundred units are gonna get shipped. We're, we've got orders for them, we're able to make them, we're gonna ship them. If there's a gap, it's the demand planner's responsibility to identify the miss and work with sales and supply on solutions to close the gap. So what happens if orders exceed the plan, right? The gap is on the um, positive, meaning that we have um, 100 units to supply, but demand is at 120 for that month. The sales organization and demand need to work together to prioritize the customer needs and decide which customers get the limited material that's available. Now you're doing this knowing what makes the most money for the company and which customers are most important to the long-term growth of the company. Or maybe which one's screaming the loudest, you just gave them a price increase and you can't possibly go back and short the material, right? All of that's on the table. So let's say that work was done, it was done well. Now we have a good demand plan at the customer level, and we can go back through either sales, CSR, all of it, to set and meet the commitments to the customers. Okay, um, this work also includes aligning our future demand plan to our sales policies and our order fulfillment practices. So you can't freeze a demand plan, let's say, that has disconnected with our own policies. Let's say we have a really long lead time 
we already have the orders on the books, you can't pop in a bunch of demand in the short term because you're violating your own policies, for example. Okay, hopefully you can see that doing this, let's call it demand execution or forecast realization, doing this right leads to um, optimizing your profit, your sales revenue, and customer service all at one time. Connecting the demand planners to this work also gives them firepower for building a more accurate demand plan in the next cycle. So they're, they're done that one month plan, they're planning the next month already and they've already gotten this huge insight into the demand because they were just living it through the order fulfillment. So let's talk about um, three best practices. These build on each other. So first, the demand planner is comparing open orders and actual sales to the frozen demand plan, which should be your sales target for the month. So Lynn, like we were talking about, right? So that work is happening. The demand planners recognize demand variances where demand is on plan and where it isn't. And they're taking action on this by engaging sales, customer service, or supply to um, go after missing orders or shift orders as needed. And then demand planners are providing formal and routine communication of, of how the month is going. It's most likely a report that's being emailed out or maybe it's a place where everybody knows to go and maybe it's in Tableau or Excel or some common system that the cross-functional organization can see how we're doing in the month. Again, that's that one set of numbers we're all um, focused on. So time for a poll. Which best describes your organizational ability to manage and prioritize demand? So at the highest level, demand planners are involved in ensuring the current month demand plan and sales targets are met. In the second case, demand planners are not involved in meeting the current month demand plan and sales targets. Third, we don't know if the demand planners are involved in meeting the monthly targets or we don't have demand planners. And we're gonna wait for a couple more people to come in so we get about the same level of participation. And okay, Lori, let's, uh, let's close that. So we have about 30% of the folks that are in the first category. Demand planners are involved in ensuring the monthly demand plan and sales targets are met. About 10% of the people are in the second category, but about half of us are in the third category where I don't really know whether my demand planners are involved in it, which again, speaks to the, I'm not sure I really know if there's a process or if I'm in the process, I don't know this. Yeah. Got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've come to uh, a recap now. So we're gonna do two recaps at uh, with two examples. So let me go back to that example of 120 units, but we've only 120 units that are, are um, in our demand, but we only have 100 units to sell. We are influencing demand through that customer prioritization because we're deciding who gets what. We're planning demand in a way that recognizes the supply limitations and our sales policies. We're communicating the plan because everyone's aligned on that 100 units, that's all we get. And we're ensuring that the orders come in to meet the plan. If the orders are over 100, like they are, we need to manage the orders to align to the plan. So you can see how they all work together because they're all happening at the same time. This isn't an easy lift. Um, as an individual, demand planning is not a simple thing. Um, let's use another example for a longer term horizon. We've got a lot of marketers here. Let's say we are introducing a new product offering into an existing market. And we're doing that in, the, in um, the second half of like six to 12 months. So we're six to 12 months out. Okay, we're influencing demand by launching this new product. So we're changing the um, competitive landscape. We're changing our customers' buying options. The demand plan for the months six to 12 needs to include the phase in of that additional demand Maybe there's a phase out that's happening. Maybe some customers are switching products. Maybe we're not actually adding demand, but it's a change. All that has to be tracked in the demand plan. We need the documented assumptions about the rollout and any risks if things don't go as planned. So all that has to be in the plan. 
the new, new demand, um, as well as those assumptions and risks, have to be communicated because it's not just about the short term. We need to be looking at that six to 12 because sales, supply, and finance need to be on board with the projections that are in the demand plan. And then lastly, as that six to 12 month window is getting closer and closer, we have to recognize that hope is not a plan. So mm -hmm. let's say you really did hope that this was going to launch well, but you need to start watching for the customer demand to say, yes, I really do want this, and the orders to come in for the new offering, because if they don't come in, and I've been in this situation, if it's not happening, you've got to take it out of the plan. All the best intentions, but reality is in that shorter term window, you you can't have a placeholder for something that's not going to be sold. And that's in that window of executing the plan. So again, if we've done this well, we've increased customer satisfaction and we've optimized profitability. I think that 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 last piece is so, so difficult, particularly for the, the sales force that at the end of the month has a number, set of numbers they have to make. And um, ahead of the numbers that need to be there saying, I don't think that that, that deal is going to go in or I don't think that that order is coming through is just, um, it's a difficult job because there's all these other repercussions about those changes. Um, and the, the companies that I've seen been able to do this are the ones that lift those painful retributions that happen when the monthly plan isn't made or even the quarterly plan isn't made. Um, but then again, you know, um, over optimistic sales uh, plans that then don't materialize are all of the operations headache at the end of the day. And, exactly. and, then, and then you end up with too much inventory and now you're running sales and discounting and trying to get rid of product if, if you have to. I know we don't really see that at this moment in time. We are on the other side of this feeling pretty good about ourselves thinking, got more people wanting things than I have. How long can we keep that going? That feels really great if you're on the sales marketing side, but it won't last. It won't last. Yeah, this is great. Yep. All so, right, so go ahead. Yep. So one can more, I do one more? more? Let's do it, yep. Okay, one more. Um, Tell me where your most critical gaps are. Which of these four elements, influencing, planning, communicating, or managing and prioritizing? And I don't know if you can check all that apply, Lori. I don't know if that was possible. Oh, it does. Check out all the apply. Good. Okay, so you can check more than one answer if, they, if more than one applies to you. Now let's give it a second there to just get a sense of that. Um, we got about halfway there. Keep going. Again, if you have more than one answer, go ahead. But what is the most critical thing that you're needing? Okay, let's call that good, Lori. Let's show that one. So about 30% of us think influencing demand, 20% um, planning demand, 40% communicating demand, and then 50% managing and prioritizing demand at the end of the day, um, which, awesome. which really just generally says that other than planning demand, we have a lot of work that we need to do to figure out how to make sure that everybody's all singing from the same sheet. You know, I, I can remember in my world where we finally in, introduced an SNOP process that was truly an SNOP process, not one in name only with meetings that occurred, but then nobody really owned their pieces of it. Exactly. Yeah. And when it finally happened, it was an amazing thing for customer satisfaction because now I was no longer having to explain to my customers why we didn't ship on time because we did. We could ship on time. We knew exactly what we had and when we were going to have it. And it was a beautiful thing. It's and so, about setting a meeting commitments, right? Yeah. And so the metric that drove everything for all of this SNOP, which is, you know, SNOP came to us from the operations side with them begging people to stop changing demand so much. They could figure out what to make. And really what drove it was our uh, stoplight chart of customer satisfaction by customer, which was interesting green with the red. Right. And uh, and when it turned out that that made more money to us, that meant far more money to us at the end of the day was customer. Satisfied. That's very mature. That's a very mature process that you did that with. It's great. Uh, it, but it was it was what drove the ability to get to the process, because without that, I think the sales guys were and, and marketing along with them were just struggling to figure out why do we want to do this for operations? You know that it, yeah. they, just, they can spend more money. We have plenty of margin. Go get it done. Right. No, no, no. It's customer satisfaction in the end, which saves everybody a headache. 
So this is beautiful. Anybody have any questions? I know we're right at the top of the hour here. Um, and this has been recorded. And Lori, you can go ahead and stop recording. Um, this will this recording will be sent.